start recording. Uh, shall, I, shall I start? Yes. Go okay. for it. Yeah. So, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining this Editoria demo session. I will talk uh, less than uh, Vincent. Uh, let me just uh, mention briefly that um, we're going to share the notes. Uh, if you go on the left, of your screen on the upper side of the screen you can see the links which are related to what uh, vincent is sharing today and uh, if you have any other uh, notes or links please share them on the chat and we'll go we're going to group them all together uh, in one place to share them alongside with the recording keep in mind that uh, we will upload on the archive page of, of open publishing fest also, the, uh, all the information that we're going to share today, alongside with the notes, including the video. Uh, and um, without further ado, uh, I would like to ask Vincent if you can share some uh, general information about yeah. Editoria, what it is. And after that, I can also jump in, adding more information as well. All right. So I am Vincent van Gerven Uy. I am a co-director of Punk and Books. Um, and uh, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I have been appointed to uh, give a demo of Editoria. So um, the, the history of, of Punctum and Editoria goes back quite a few years. I remember somewhere in 2016 or 17, uh, Eileen, my, my colleague and co-director, um, said, hey, there it is, uh, there's this new uh, project, this software that they're developing. Uh, back then it was uh, started out by, uh, by the Google Foundation in collaboration with, I think, the California Digital Library and, um, and University of California Press. And um, it, it, was, uh, it was developed, as, as Adam Hyde, the, the founder, has, has, has said, basically as a as a program that is going to, is supposed to defeat Google Docs and InDesign at the same time. Um, and it's that is quite a tall order. Um, but I think that after the initial steps and we got involved uh, more seriously in 2018 uh, in, in the development and beta testing of, of, of previous editoria, uh, that it is coming to maturity to such an extent that I think that at least we can try and, and take this into, into operation, into, into a book publishing uh, pipeline. I know that there are already other publishers out there, um, specifically ATLA, the Association of Theological Library, or the Theological Library Association, something like this. Um, they already use this, I think, for most of their publications, and probably Redon knows a bit better than me how they're going. Um, um, so Punctum has been involved with Editorial since 2018, and it is precisely uh, what I said. It's 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 a, it's a, a collaborative environment uh, online uh, for the editing um, and uh, uh, reviewing and proofing of uh, text. And so in our case, these are books, um, and also it harnesses to an extension that's HJS, it harnesses the um, print to PDF capacities of your browser to produce from those um, documents printable PDF files. Uh, it can also output EPUBs, it can output uh, ICML files that are interchange files for InDesign. Um, um, so it, the idea is, is to, to also rethink, at least for us, to rethink our production pipeline. Because what we're doing right now is we get Word documents that we edit in Word and that, you know, we have to send back and forth by email. Um, we have to do, you know, some form of version control on that, especially with edited collections. You usually have a lot of different actors. Uh, you have editors, you have authors. Um, sometimes you have external designers and so on. And so these all need to collaborate. And that collaboration happens basically through the exchange of Word documents by email. Is cumbersome that is very uh, sensitive to mistakes. Then what happens is we take those, <clears throat> excuse me, we take those uh, Word documents and we basically manually transfer these into InDesign. This is again a process that can be only partially automated, so it has a risk of introducing errors that you then will have to correct in a proofing stage. 
And at the end of this line, you only have a PDF. This PDF is usually perfect. I mean, because India is, is a very, is basically an, an out-developed program, right? So you can create basically perfect PDFs with this, uh, exactly what you want, and it can go to print. But you cannot create an EPUB, you cannot create an XML, you cannot create an HTML, you cannot create all these other formats that are becoming more and more important, not only in terms of, uh, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, accessibility, right? Um, so PDF is, is notoriously inaccessible to people that have uh, um, uh, issues with eyesight, for example. They cannot be automatically transformed into speech for people with um, hearing disabilities. So there is an access accessibility issue there with PDS, but there's also that uh, increasingly, and I'm not sure whether I'm a fan about this of this, but this is reality, increasingly a lot of the texts that we produce as humans are not read by humans, but by machines. And so PDFs that's really are, are, are machine readable, but only to a certain extent. And XML is much better for a machine to be read, um, much less for us, but that doesn't mean that we should uh, prioritize one over the other, especially when the entire aim of open access publishing, or at least as we see it, is trying to maximize the dissemination of publicly funded knowledge, right? And so why not also cater to machines? So the wonderful thing about Editoria is, is that it does cater to all of these different uh, readers, machine readers, readers with disabilities, and readers that like a paper book. And so um, for us, this was the main reason to enter, enter into this process. Um, with Coco and 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 really be um, involved in in that development trajectory that f for now already at least we have been involved for more than two years I think by now. Um, so I I've never done a demo like this, um, and I'm not sure whether I'm going to start a demo right now. But I think Redon is probably wants to say something more generally about deployment. Is that so, Redon? And then I will basically give you a run through about how we now started to use this version, the current version of Editoria, which is the first version that we are going to use in production. And it's the first version that, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's really quite developed since the last version that we tested. So it's the first, we again are in this learning process of figuring out, you know, what are the bugs? What are the things to do? What are the things we cannot do? And I will also walk you a little bit through you know, more detailed um, design design features and design issues, and also the way that we think about these things, you know, when when having a long-term program of switching from InDesign, which is proprietary, which is cloud-based, which we don't own, but is not open, to a system that is open, but of course has limitations and vis-a-vis uh, -vis what InDesign can do, but also a whole range of new possibilities of things that InDesign cannot do, right? So there's always this trade-off and we're trying to negotiate this trade-off um, as, as carefully as we can, keeping in mind both what our authors want, but also what we want to be as press. Um, but before, so before I give the demo, I, I turn the mic over to, uh, to Redon. And if you have any questions, sorry, Redon, any questions in the meantime, um, free to ask in the, in the public chat and we'll try, you know, at any point, I keep an eye on them, and Redon will keep an eye on them, and we will try to address them uh, at any point when they come in. I, I, I just wanted to start with a question uh, for for people that, that are not publishers. So can you, uh, and also this was going to help us, uh, going to help you with the demo, I think. So can you explain how many people are involved in the book production process in, a, in one or two sentences so that people can understand how complex is uh, the whole process from A to to Z, um, because this is going to help understand the participants, the demo, uh, the access levels that are going to have there. And after that, I can, I can also share how you can get help and how you can install it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that, that's helpful, actually, uh, Redon. So like if, you know, because like I, as I said, this is the first time I'm giving the demo of this software. It is software that I'm also still learning in a way, uh, trying to figure out myself what I can do with it. Um, so if there's anything unclear or you want to, you see something that you really, you know, can you click on that? Like, what does that do? How does this work? Specific aspects of the book production project pro, uh, pro, um, process that, you know, you want to know about, then yeah, please drop us a line. 
So uh, the official website, uh, before going on with the demo, the official, I just want to mention that the official website is editorial.pub, which is on the shared notes. Uh, but one important thing to understand is that Editoria is open source software, which means that is produced, uh, developed uh, in a way that you can not only use it uh, without asking permission, uh, downloading, and you can also host it in uh, your own servers. You can ask somebody else to do it. And But if you need help in the whole process, which might be technical help or uh, any kind of questions that you might have, uh you, you can go to uh, several uh, communication channels that uh, might be a chat a forum uh or also you can um, mainly these are the two main communication channels so if you go to discourse.coco.foundation there is a dedicated session about uh editoria and mainly there are many a lot of people asking technical stuff on, on how you can install it but even if, if you are a user you can ask all the questions over there so probably after the demo a lot of us are going to have uh, questions so that's a very good place to be because this is going to help other people in case they have any questions to search if the issue that they have they can search through the discussions so that they can find a solution but if you want also something else you can go to mattermost.editorial.pub or mattermost.coco.foundation where you can um, have direct conversations with people that build uh, the software technically but also other people that are using it uh, which might have had the same uh, uh, they've been stuck somewhere and they want to learn more about the software as well. So again, you can download the code, you can host it on your own server, you can ask somebody else to do it, or if you have any other question, you can go to the forum or to the chat. Again, I'm pasting all the uh, chat, uh, on, the, on the chat, I'm pasting all the links, uh, but again, this is going to be available after the, uh, the demo uh, on uh, the archive page of openpublishingfest.org. Um, so having said that, that I think, uh, Vincent, if you can start yep. sharing yep. the screen. Sure. Um, there's just one question that I actually don't really know the answer to. Uh, how many, from Anthony Mazur, uh, how many publishers using Editoria? I mean, I know I know the, the really, like, let's say the, the development group, like the, the presses and institutions that actively collaborate with the Coco Foundation Editoria and we have like, or we used to have, we don't at the moment, but we used to have like bi biannual meetings where we would meet up and run through the latest iteration of the software, catch bugs, discuss features, decide on features, right? So these, these were like basically stakeholder meetings. And I think probably all, across all the meetings, I have seen like 20 institutions that are really working on helping the development. Of, of Editoria, when it comes to actually implementing the software, I think this number is much higher because it's open source and we cannot really uh, patrol who downloads it, right? Moreover, um, Editoria as a package contains several components and we'll see these components in the demo that individually can also be used separately, right? So some people choose to use the, the editor, embed it in their whatever workflow and are just happy with that. Other people do not want the editor part but only want the output part page yes and they can work on their own you know just dumping raw html or xml into it and it will also still produce a pdf files so right so there is a certain type of of um uh uh, uh how do you say this uh, it, it it consists of different components that are all interoperable but that can also be used separately right so it is also sometimes difficult to define or um difficult to explain i also found this difficult in the, in the beginning to understand what is editorial precisely, what what does it consist of, and so I'm I'm gonna run through that. Um, so I hope that answers your question a little bit. But we we don't we don't have an official tally, or at least I don't. Maybe Adam has, or maybe Redon has, but I don't. Uh, yeah. So I think the folks from um, the Coco Foundation have they are talking to anyone, uh, including institutions and also individual users. I personally have seen on the chat um, a lot of people asking that people that. It's obvious that we don't know, uh, and also co the uh, people from Coco don't know, which are from all over the place, from all, all over the world. And they ask technical questions, which, me which means that there are quite a few people that they are 
playing around with the software and trying to install it and understand and they're uh, when they're stuck they they ask there on the chat so there there is no number at least but i think if you ask uh if you go to the mattermost chat of coco foundation uh there are people there all the time that have more uh, context about this me personally i know that on um starting from uh, open publishing fest there have been a growing number of people asking for editoria um but again the numbers uh, the folks from uh, coco foundation have uh, should have uh, the numbers but also their numbers they should not be uh, correct because as vincent mentioned uh, everybody can download the software and can install it somewhere in a server if they have the technical know-how okay so uh, also, while, while Vincent shares the demo, uh, I asked Julian from the chat uh, if he can share one or two sentences about PageGS, which is an, uh, an important component of the ecosystem. Uh, and there are people that are uh, might be interesting uh, in there. There is also the website for anyone that um, wants to uh, have more information. Okay. Now we're now we're now we're just really throwing a lot of like terms and words at you and, and components. So let's actually look yes. at this thing. So I'm gonna try and share the screen. I don't know if I'll be able to see the chat or any of you or we're done while I do this. So like, I'm gonna just give that a try. I, I, I will check the chat and uh, I will, I will, okay. I will okay. jump in if, if anyone yes. has any question. Great. So I think this is working. Okay, so you can see me. Um, we have uh, Editoria uh, installed dedicated server. Uh, we're Don has been kind enough to help with that. Um, and uh, here we can log in. And this is basically uh, how it looks. As you can see, there is currently, um, can you also see me while I'm gesticulating or I don't, or, or can you only see the screen? You can only see the screen, right? Screen, only the screen, one tab and uh, the mouse moving around. Okay, good, that's fine. Um, so here you can see we have, a single book in here, um, but why don't we just start completely from the beginning uh, and and we can see what this looks like. So this is basically the main menu. It shows the book. Uh, I can edit the book. Uh, here we go. Uh, and we will talk about what this is in a minute. And can go back. I can rename it. I can archive it. I can sort this thing by title. So kind of standard things that you want to that you would want to do. Um, I can uh, have a user profile here where I can change my password. Um, there's a team manager uh, in which I can manage the different uh, people uh, working on books and assign them and so on. Um, and here we have a templates menu, which we will discuss. Uh, in, and you see it's a little bit compressed because I, a little bit better. It's just the screen is not big enough. Um, templates, which we will discuss in a moment. So back to books. Um, to start a new book project, um, we can add book here. I'm just gonna call this demo. Um, and we can now edit this book. So as you can see here, this is uh, 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 an overview of the book. What I can do is I can assign people to the book here, uh, users that have made an account, I can assign them here, I give them different levels of access to the different files. I can uh, add some metadata here about the book, uh, like ISBN and stuff. I can export the book, which we will look at in a little bit more detail. And we also have your book settings. And at the moment, book settings mainly deals with the settings of the running headers, um, which we will see in action in a moment. Um, there are three different parts of a book, a front matter, body, and back matter. And you can add different components to these, and you can move these in between. But let's just start and uh, upload some Word files, because Editoria, in the end, ironically, eats Word files. Um, and this is usually the way that we also get our book files. So this is not a full restriction, but I don't think it can, for example, eat LibreOffice files at the moment. Um, so let's go here and get uh, a real book. It's the same book that's already in there because I know what it looks like. Uh, uh, Vincent, if you yep. can um, remove your video so that people can see bigger the, the demo, it will go, it's, it's helped for a bit. Okay, I can. This is as big as I can go. No, no, I mean your video, if you can stop it, uh, because oh. people are, yeah. How, how, okay. Um, how do I stop that here? The webcam, yeah, yeah perfect. Like this? So now, yes, yes, so now it's better. Okay, Thanks. good, great. Thank you. So can, 
just tell me when you cannot see something or tell Redon when you cannot see something because I am now completely blind. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm editing, I'm adding here the word documents. This I've already been like nicely. Um, it will convert these files. And here we have our different files here. As you can see, they are not in the right order, um, but I can simply drag these guys in the right order. Uh, there's a glossary and a bibliography. And these two things are back matter items, so I'm just dumping them here. Um, so now you see that um, these different files are being processed, but these, for example, the introduction and these first three chapters are already ready. Uh, and you can see that it is here in the file prep uh, stage. So this is the first stage or several stages in Editoria, uh, file prep, edit, review, clean up, page check, and final. These are of course flexible, but they give you a sense of like how far a book is moving into a pipeline and only people and only uh, specific um, settings are allowed to move a book further along. So this can this allows you to keep track of where we are, but we're now in file prep, which is we are in the beginning stage, the word files have been uploaded and we want to do something with them to make, to clean them up um, before uh, a copy editor, for example, deals with them. Um, besides this file prep, you see also here an edit. When I click edit, I go into the file. We'll do that in a moment. We can delete it. And we can also set at where these um, different chapters begin. And we personally like always chapters to start on a recto page. So I can select that here. And now they will start on the recto page. Um, at the moment, they are not part of the table of contents, but obviously I like these different elements to be part of the table of contents, so I'm, which is automatically generated, as you will see in a bit. Um, and then furthermore, what you can see here is that I can also, so this is a chapter, it's a chapter, so that's um, If it's a part, uh, then I can select part, and then it will automatically uh, order the pertinent chapters underneath it or unnumbered, right? Sometimes you have something that's unnumbered, as in the case of a glossary. Uh, we can call this a component. We can even call this an appendix if you like, and it will um, and it will output that accordingly. So for now, we can just call this a standard component. The last thing is notes placeholder, which we will use in a moment. We will see what this is used for. All right, so let's go in into our introduction and have a look at the editor. So you simply just click, and here we are inside. So this is an environment that looks pretty much like uh, or comparable to uh, Google Docs, like the document editor. Uh, as you can see here, there are different styles that you can apply um, to the text, headers, authors, Subtitles, titles, general text, extracts, source notes. Um, you can make custom styles. For example, I have a custom style that's called bibliography. Um, and you can simply create new ones. And we will talk a little bit about what that does as well. And here you can see all the footnotes very nicely here that still need to be cleaned up. Um, the notes are indicated here in the text like so. And so when you click on one of them, it goes to these footnotes here. Again, my screen is a little bit small here because I'm working on a laptop, so but you can see here very nicely how that works. And if you click the note, then you also go back here. So this all works very nicely. And you can just drop this down a little bit. Um, so let's clean this up. Um, first, we just want to call this a title. Um, this is a general text. It does the indentation and so on. I think, but what is important, and this is something that at least took me a while to wrap my head around, is that um, this representation here is simply the representation of the text in this editor. And so all of these styles and all the custom styles that you make have an envelope in the a page CS output engine in the way that they're defined within CSS. And CSS is, uh, stands for cascading style sheets. 
which is the way in which style definitions are made within within a, 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 an HTML environment. I'm probably garbling up all these um, all these different terms, but I'm sure that Redon will uh, correct me when I'm wrong or when I'm terribly wrong. Um, so authors will inevitably ask, you know, but I don't like little bubble here for the footnote too like why does it have to be this is not clear but this is purely a representation of a footnote in a collaborative editing environment as you will see in a little bit it is completely different from how these things are represented in in a in 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 a laid out page and so in the same way actually in the way that a word document is completely different from a laid out page in indesign the beauty of editoria is is that Whereas with Word and InDesign, I need to transform one into the other, basically through a partially manual process. In this case, they are intimately linked. Um, there, I need to do very little to move from one to the other form in terms of like uh, manual labor. And at least for us, that is a big that is a big plus. So you know, this is let's this is now first heading. That's fine. Um, let's see what other things are going. Maybe they like a, an a, Maybe this is like a citation block quote. We can make it like this. Um, we can obviously make things bold here. We can make things superscript or subscript. We can make things uh, small cap. So it, it has all these uh, elements that you would expect from a word processor. Um, I can add comments here, add a comment, uh, change this. There, and now it's here. I can and say uh, you're wrong so this is all nice oops i can also say okay we dealt with this goodbye um so again things that you remember from word and obviously what it also does is it uh, allows you to track changes so now i'm just adding some text here and deleting some text there and it shows this and it allows me to hide these things like it does in word or show them allows me to just go through them and accept or go to the next one and reject these different edits. Um, there are special characters. I can make lists. Um, there is a spell check, which I'm not sure yet how well that works. Um, I can enter different code if I would want to have, have code, which I don't in this case. So just, okay. um, and I can also add images. And so the image, uh, as I know at the moment, I haven't really looked at how this works. The image, um, let's just add this image in here. We are currently working on the image captioning and the, the let's say, the, the management of uh, management of uh, media assets within a book because you know it would be ideal if you know if I use this image here and I also use it in another book. You know, like in WordPress or something, you would just be able to go to Media Manager and just select the same image rather than constantly uploading it. For now, it just works like works like this, and I can also just get it, get rid of this image again. Vincent, if I may yeah. add, so it's uh, I just want to emphasize that there are different people with different access or different <laughs> things that they can do. So there is the author, the editor, production manager, and the admin admin person. So the, and the collaborate you can give. So different people have different access on the what they can do uh, through all the, the whole process. So basically, it's just like having the, all these people in one place, in one office, and just working uh, there. Yeah. So be, I'm telling this because sometimes when we uh, it's uh, it's uh, one of the the access levels is one of the things that people ask more, uh, most frequently, at least in my uh, in my experience. Yeah, that's because people are afraid of authors changing your text. I personally don't really mind, uh, but you're completely right, Redon. Um, so technically, if someone I think is uh, is an author, they can write text and so on. But then when they are like only a reviewer, then they can only do that much. Sometimes they you can set them such that you know you they can only approve corrections, but they cannot make any additional corrections. Corrections, thus avoiding you know the endless cycle of revisions. Um, so there are different access levels, as Ridon indicated, and you can set that uh, depending on the role somebody has in a book project. Um, I haven't really exper experimented with that uh, extensively. I just always give people like 
global access to do whatever they want to a book and then then expect them to behave uh, uh, responsibly. So then we can make this different headings and so on. All right, so this is basically how you set up a book. As you can see, this already looks pretty good. It has imported the italics from Word. Um, it probably has imported, you know, it has recognized that this is a heading and labeled it appropriately. So there's already a lot of stuff happening when you import a Word document. Of A lot of stuff is already happening that editor, yeah, recognized itself and it's like, okay. Um, we have here our introduction and we can just save this here. We're happy with this. And we go back to our book. And now we see this is perfectly named introduction because we said introduction is the title. And we can also go with this one, for example, and say, well, this is chapter one. Yeah, so. so as you can see, this is now chapter two. So actually I should go back and I should say that this is unnumbered. You see now this is chapter one. It's perfectly chapter one as it should be. It's a title. And again, here you can see nicely all these Italics have been imported. We have our M dashes. We're very happy with that. Uh, our footnotes are not set in the style that we need, but we'll just fix that during the editorial process. But overall, this looks really, this looks really nice. All right. So, um, unless there are any questions about like the editor part, which is called Wax, by the way, I can also see by the way how many notes there are. There are like comments, track changes, etc. Uh, unless there are any questions about this, I'm quickly looking at the Justin, is there a comment history or once you mark a comment thread, is it done, it's just gone? That's a good question, Justin. I don't know actually if this version already has um, a history of uh, comments. For example, like, so the question of Justin is, so if I add a comment here uh, and then I say add another comment, um, and I say, okay, we fixed all of these problems. It's now done. And I say, okay, goodbye. Thank you very much. Where does that comment go? Um, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, I also don't know, uh, but I would assume that there is no history at the moment, yeah. but um, don't take it for, I, I need to get back to this because I'm not sure. Maybe Julien can, um, you then do if you have any uh, info, please share it on the chat. It may, may they maybe go to comments heaven. Yeah, yeah. Where no, I, so so Justin says I can see myself accidentally marking a thread as resolved and then need to restore it. Um, I do this also all the time, and um, moreover, and this is also something that has come up in the editoria community meetings before, is that. Um, for our own record keeping, it may be useful to have actually a record of all the mutations that have been done to a document over its life cycle. So not only its comments, but also its um, all the track changes that have happened to a document, uh, simply because it is nice to have uh, like a full record of destruction of a book. Um, at the moment, I don't think that exists, but I know that this is definitely like one of the things that the team is working on. I mean. I think we must all remember that we're looking here at a piece of software in development and that we are simply starting to use it because we think that it is ready to be used despite you know some features not not being there uh, such as indeed comment comment tracking and that sort of thing so um keeping that in mind let's have a look uh, let's go back i just want to save and quit and let's have a look at the um exporting uh, part. So at the moment, uh, page JS as it functions right now, and as I understand from Julian, it only uh, supports endnotes because footnotes um, are are a specific uh, design challenge within this uh, environment. And so we'll go with endnotes for today. Um, and so here I select a template that you could have seen here. And so like, let me just show you a little bit what a template looks like. Uh, so click update. So a template has a name, uh, it's an author. This is our standard trim size, five by eight. Um, it's used in PageJS, it has endnotes. And then so it, here it includes all the different um, font files and a CSS file. Again, the style sheet uh, that we're currently in developing, right? So the style sheet you'll see is also not done yet. I only started work on that like a couple of weeks ago. So 
this is still work in progress as well for us. So this, these are the templates, and you see some other templates from Etla, which has been uh, much further in implementing usage of, of, of Editoria. Uh, and they have developed a bunch of, of templates as well for their own books. So let's go back to uh, a book here. Uh, or, and now it's, there's also another way of exporting books for Viglio style. Um, it's, it's less developed than the page AS way of exporting. As far as I know, I've never used a view style. So um, what you see here is on the left side, uh, we see all the CSS definitions, which looks terribly intimidating. And I will tell you that I only understand half of them, but Julian has been very patient in explaining me a lot of the uh, definitions. But basically what this thing does is that um, in the CSS, it takes all the definitions um, that we have uh, used in our editor. So just to go back, oh, just to go back. So everything that we have marked here, this is a title, this is a text, this is, uh, this is italics, uh, um, this is a footnote, this is the beginning of a paragraph. Um, there's a new paragraph here. So all these different elements that we have marked out here while working together with the author, with the editor on our book, um, all of these have been, uh, let's say, transformed into uh, tags that we can then manipulate and redefine uh, according to our uh, style sheet. So let's go, let's go back here. This. So here we go. So as you can see, this already looks very much like a book. Uh, there's a page. This is a page of five by eight. There's a grid. Uh, this grid will not be printed, but it is purely for uh, my own orientation that has a specific line height. There's a text block. Uh, hyphenation is, is going on here. There are pages. There are running headers. Um, I see that the running header is always on the right side, so I should fix it that for the left page it's on the left side, but this is all fixable. Um, you see here there is a block quote. The block quote is styled in italics. Maybe I want to change that. Um, so you can see here that the basics of a book are already here, right? It knows that I like it when after a section you start without an indent. Uh, if you want an indent here or a drop cap or you want the entire uh, first line uh, capitalized and green with an underline, then all of these things are things that you can define here on the left. Uh, and I'm absolutely not qualified to tell you how to do that, but there are a lot of people in our community that are. Um, for example, here, this is based on Atla style, so Atla had this very nice chapter thing here. don't know if I like it, but um, these are all things that you can define by yourself. And so when we go towards the end. Let's see if I can just grab this quickly. And then here we come in our end notes. Um, and these are also like a very basic style, but they give end notes. We have a repetition of our chapter here. And as you can see, all the links and so on, these are all clickable. Again, this is, this is very nice because uh, what comes out of here is a PDF that also automatically have all these clickable, all these clickable links. Um, another thing that you can see, and that is also automatically generated, is our table of contents. We didn't add any font matter, so we didn't add any French title page, we didn't add any colorful information, and so on. But all of these things can be separately styled uh, precisely according to your, uh, precisely according to your wishes. And as you can see, um, the table of contents starts on a recto page. Then we have one white page, which is automatically inserted because we said that the introduction starts on a recto, right? So all of, all of this information that we have given at the beginning, uh, both in our, in our book manager and in our editor is transferred um, as HTML and subsequently this whole style sheet is applied to it. For example, I mean, can, I can look at, I can tell you a little bit like, for example, here, this, for example, what this does, it says, okay, when um, 
we have the first page of a chapter. So uh, let's say a, a real chapter as this one. We have the first page of a chapter, then there's nothing happening at the top right, right? So I don't want any running header here. Um, this is about auto hyphenation. This is a definition of how the end notes are styled. Um, this would be the beginning of a style for when I have a page with contributors. Um, this is what happens in an appendix on the left and the right page. And so like, what, what is so fascinating for me, uh, and maybe I should just for the moment um, go out of here. And basically when you then press print, uh, let me just do this for, for a moment when you press print. Um, I can say, save this as a PDF. And I can basically export this thing I see here on minus the grid, of course, um, to a PDF. And that PDF I can send to a printer. Uh, if I have images with a bleed, I can export a PDF that has that bleed. If I want a PDF that has crop marks, it I can export that. So like, it all the export functionalities are basically like um, you have uh, in InDesign. However, it is not a graphically based approach, but it is an approach based that is based on uh, on, a, on an HTML environment, on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a CSS style sheet environment. And so maybe what I should do is I'm gonna, for the moment, stop sharing this um, because I get really anxious if I cannot, if you cannot see my gesticulations. Um, and I'm gonna switch on back my webcam. Uh, yep. Yeah. See if this is working. All right. So can everybody see me again? Um, what for us, at, at least at Punctum, has been so terribly interesting about Editoria, and this is also something that I have to thank the people at PageJS for. So PageJS is the engine that transforms the HTML from the editor into a PDF output. What I find so fascinating about about editoria as a, as, a, as a as a product of course it's great that you can collaboratively edit a document but this is not something new in the sense right i mean the wax editor as a collaborative environment um is is tailored towards working with scholarly manuscripts right it has all this footnote apparatus and so on um but what i think is is truly um the revolutionary aspect is 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 rethinking book design from the perspective of uh, the pixel, right? Because at the end of the day, when we when you work in, in InDesign, you're still very much in a in an environment that is that is operating with a uh, vocabulary that derives directly from artisanal book printing, and there's nothing wrong with it, and I love it. But at the moment that we're thinking about, you know, producing digital objects like a PDF or an EPUB or an XML file or any other type of file that may be read, you know, even by non-humans. Um, I think that we as designers, and in, the, in, in, in you know, I am now talking about myself as a book designer, we have to be ready to rethink what it means to design a book and what are the parameters, uh, what is the vocabulary, what are the parameters with which we do that design. And for me, that has been a learning process, but it's been a very fruitful one because it really made me realize that, um, that there are some things that that we take for granted in you know in design book production, let's say, that are incredibly difficult to do think from the perspective of the pixel. And there are other things that are ridiculously difficult to do when you are in InDesign, but that are like super easy when you are thinking from the perspective of CSS, from, from the perspective of the pixel rather than from the perspective of the point or the pika, right? To to use an, some weird analogy. Um, and so I think that is for me also really the exciting part. So at the end of the day, what we're going to produce with Toria is other standard, uh, uh, by all means and standards, a standard uh, scholarly monograph. But what you can actually do, the potential, I think, of this type of software in terms of also design and pushing design forward is enormous. And, and I personally, I'm very excited to be part of, of that community. If you see what other people that, you know, CSS wizards are able to pull out of a simple HTML file in terms of visual design, in terms of like 
visual presentation, it is absolutely mind blowing. And so, uh, 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 um, when when we talk about transitioning, or at least when when I talk about transitioning to Editoria, it is not only about we need a piece of software that is useful and practical that we can use to streamline our production pipeline. Of course, I'm interested in that. Uh, but I think what is even more interesting about this piece of software is that it really has a potential to completely uh, this software and many other you know open source projects like it um, has the potential to really reshape the way that we think book design. Um, and and I cannot say that I uh, have truly grasped the potential, but I see this I see this in other design projects, and I think that is terribly exciting. And I think already from that perspective, it is worth to engage with it as a publisher, because you know, you don't want to be the publisher that is still using your Gutenberg press when somebody else is using a Macintosh. And I feel very much that we are in the same type of, we're, we're in the same type of uh, 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 situation right now, right? InDesign is at some point going to be obsolete. This is a ridiculous way to deal with graphic design in a digital environment. It is, it is fully based on the metaphorical universe of the of the of the of the of the line drawn on a paper, you know, of all kinds of things that you can do in the material world. So I believe that the way that Editoria approaches book design uh, through PageJS is a completely novel way to look at what it means to produce content made for the human eye, but also for the machine eye. And so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of my pitch. Um, <laughs> uh, if if there, I, I would be happy to talk about other aspects of the. Uh, uh, of the of the software itself and go back into screen sharing if anyone wants specific questions um, yeah so so that was it so there was the this question from Lisa uh, she's asking if you can um, change uh, uh, the template uh, if only through CSS or you can also do it from a user no, you interface. change the you change the templates through CSS so like it will have to be a relearning for designers um, yeah, but but if what happens if uh, her question her question was what happens if someone doesn't feel comfortable, uh, yeah, doesn't then, have the knowledge of CSS? Then you have so, to learn CSS. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I had to learn CSS. I I still don't understand it completely, but I mean, for me, this is about learning a new tool for bookmaking. It is not about. But again, I'm being ideological here, and this may not be this may not be the position of other people working with the software. Right? But when you ask me this question. It is about learning a new way of bookmaking. And I am not interested in replicating InDesign CSS. I'm interested in investigating and understanding CSS as a way of designing books. And so that means to learn and engage with it. Do I have enough time for that? No. Do I have enough brain capacity for that? No. But like, I, I think that, um, I think that there is a trade-off between making something user-friendly and making something interesting. And I am going for the interesting rather than for the usually. At this moment, there's always difference, right? Like I, I, you know, I cannot possibly do it like other people do, which is simply dump an HTML code into PageJS and then work out everything, every single design detail uh, in, in a text editor, right? I need something like Wax uh, to give me a global idea of how that text works and, you know, what is what. I, I, I have difficulties um, writing out a HTML code and feeding that to page. And we're obviously going to ask our authors to author their books in HTML code. But I do think that there is, a, 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 you know, that, that trying to, it is, it is like you're asking somebody to garden, um, I know I'm trying to make an analogy here. Uh, it's like these are gardening tools, and somebody said, "Yes, but I don't want a garden. I want to build a house." It's like, yeah, but then you need a different tool set. And so I'm interested in gardening uh, as, as a way of landscaping rather than building a house at the moment. Uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, an analogy makes sense, but I just want to add something as well. Uh, from from the time that I've been involved with Editoria in in a more not as a publisher. Uh, I see that the main challenge is for people to specifically have this the 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 energy to embrace the fact that 
there is you know there is a new way of doing uh, the book production from the beginning right and that's the uh, biggest challenge because the people like you know change is not easy for a lot of people but i think uh in in this case or in other similar cases the most important part is that you as punctum books or other publishers that are involved since the beginning in the process you mentioned 20 organizations before in in your meetings that you had. Uh, more or less i mean overall you, but maybe you, much more you, you can influence uh in different ways so if you have an, a proposal for example lisa mentioned before if i can do it with an uh, you know without css so you can be part of the conversation in one one yeah. way or the other which doesn't happen uh, was which which is something that doesn't happen with proprietary software which right. wants to impose you how you want to do your job yeah. which is you know the whole book publishing yeah. thing yeah no and it also means that you know sometimes you don't have the feature that you wanted because something else is more pressing right um it's, and it's about collectively moving towards a minimal viable product and collectively um, defining and negotiating what a minimal viable project is or can be. Um, and, and, and as Redon said, that is not something that you can do with InDesign. You just get the thing, you, you pay a ridiculous amount of money for it, and then if it doesn't do what you want, you know, like, there are many things I want to do in InDesign that doesn't do very well, uh, but there's no way I can influence that process. And, and here, yes, it's true that Editoria doesn't do everything that I want. And yes, I need, to, I need to acquire a lot of new knowledge to understand how it's doing what it's doing. But I'm in a position of, 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 uh, uh, of agency because I can talk with the people that develop this. There is this mutual understanding that they're users, that they're developers, that they, that they help giving feedback to each other. And, and, and I very much like this as an environment to, to make books in, uh, not only in terms of software, but also in terms of community of people, right? And so, so far, all my, you know, whenever I had a question, this has been, this has been, you know, worked with, and, and I'm very happy about that. And there um, are many components where people can get involved with, for example, you mentioned templates. So you can, if you are good at it, you can create templates. There are people yeah. that are good at coding, so they, they improve the bugs. There, there is a list of bugs on, on the GitLab repository of uh, editoria that you can uh, there are simple ones and there are more complex ones so there are more, others that need more time to get implemented um there are there are people that are hosting it so uh, I, I we have friends that they are uh, hosting editoria and you know they're good at, at that thing and they can help you host the software there there are people that are good you know uh, there is a lot of people with different there are they have their own thing going on and they can they, they're involved in the conversation uh and again which is something you cannot do and you cannot influence but also contribute which is a, a very good mix of stuff and there there are people like you and me and myself that they feel comfortable in this environment where you can influence things and there uh, you feel uncomfortable where a tool is imposing uh, the way you're working that's another issue. Yeah, you did, didn't it, even. It's, you didn't, it's a different you, attitude, right? I mean, I can, I can, I can deal with InDesign. Just that I don't, I, you know, fundamentally, I don't see proprietary software. But again, this is the ideology of Punctum. I don't see proprietary software to be the way to go when it comes to open access publishing. And so I'm willing to invest, you know, the time that is necessary to make that shift. Um, will it happen overnight? No. Will the book that we publish or that we now intend to publish, the book that you saw in the demo, um, through the entire editorial system, will it be as good between quote marks between, as our other books, graphically speaking? Maybe not. Maybe there is like a little white space issue. Maybe the hyphenation is not precisely calibrated right. You know, maybe um, I would like to have like to have had footnotes rather than endnotes. But footnotes are ridiculously difficult to to program, and I understand why that is, and I'm not demanding it now. So I'm fine with endnotes, right? So yes, all of these may be minus points, but the plus point is, is that we will be able to output many different formats for many different types of readers. Uh, we will be able to uh, make a book within a collaborative environment and no longer send around Word documents. Um, no more manual importing in InDesign for me which is a blessing, I must say, even though it means that my hyphenation will not be on point at every single you know, turn of the page. So it's a trade-off. 
and and it's a question about you know at what point do you enter you know at what point are you willing to 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 risk that to risk that job? So, so Justin uh, uh, has a comment. He says that you have a good point uh, for motivating power users, but also having a user interface for users who are never going to learn CSS will be but crucial this, for but adoption. This, Justin, like, and I I know you, Justin, but I don't believe this. It is saying to somebody who is writing clay tablets. And, it, and it's pointing to somebody else writing on a papyrus with a brush. It's like, don't be ridiculous. No one is ever going to write with a brush. And of course, everyone is going to learn CSS. What are you thinking? Like, no one is going to learn InDesign in 10 years. Everybody is knowing how to code. This is a lost battle. This is a lost battle for designers and for book publishers. Like, InDesign will become like knowledge how to use a linotype machine. I think this is my prediction and we better get on board with this because you know like machine reading the the the, the algorithmic reading all of this is going to increase exponentially and people and like not only people entities reading with these eyes from a piece of paper that is going to be a minuscule amount of readers compared to the ways in which the things that we will produce will be aggregated read archives negotiated in the future and so we will have to we will have to commit to the tools to make that possible but, but again but, this is like ideological me speaking but like no i believe design I have to face the fact that yes i need css but, but he, like he he, he uh, just not so because i didn't finish his comment so he says that it's a very great step though in the direction of making um the software usable for non-techies uh so i think uh, one way you didn't mention, and I wanted like to emphasize, is the fact that everything is done in a browser, uh, and the browser is the main ent entry to the internet for, and the main tool that the majority of us use. And it also is the first step towards having uh, standards in in the way your uh, people are produ uh, producing books uh, in one way or the other. So another thing I would like to add is that yes, you can. Uh, you, you, people that don't, I, I also, uh, there is an ecosystem there. There is a potential for an ecosystem that might be big. For example, if you don't know CSS, there are people that can help you um, doing the design as you want it, uh, uh, doing CSS. Or I hope, I wish that a lot of people contribute to a lot of templates that makes it very uh easy for people that do not have the time and they don't want to spend a lot of time in creating a, 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 a template by uh, from scratch so that they can use these templates so again it's i mean i don't i, I didn't make my template on mayhem julian helped me uh, and it's still helping me as i as i work my way through um and it's not you know like justin is saying not everyone that produces important work is a visionary um I don't think this has anything to do with with being a visionary, and I'm I'm being honest here. This is simply to do with a paradigm shift in our publishing industry, and this is this is just simply reality. I'm not seeing any visions. I am simply looking at numbers and the amount of reading that is happening as as we speak by human agents is minuscule compared to the amount of reading that happens online by non-human agents. This is just one example. We will have to deal with the fact that 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 knowledge processing and knowledge gathering is happening by a large extent by non-human actors at this moment. Scopus so, is not Scopus is non-human, and it doesn't it doesn't care about uh, pixels. Uh, it doesn't care about picas in InDesign. So, but, so we have to tailor. We have to think about that. I, I think we are we have a responsibility to, to our authors to think about that. Because so, in the end, our authors want to be read. Sorry, like, but this is becoming an ideological discussion, and I'm not sure if this is this no, no, the I aim just, of a demo. But uh, uh, again, I just wanted because uh, as Julian is is uh, emphasizing what I mentioned before that there are people that can help you doing the template. So this uh, going back to the demo. So there are people that want can help you with the template if you don't know CSS. There are people that absolutely will help you if you want to learn. Uh, CSS or template, and, and also there is a very nice um, blog post at pagegs.org uh, who explains uh, how uh, the process with Atla is done for the implementation of templates. I think, Julian, you have activated your mic. Do you want to add something? Yeah, sorry. 
Yeah, just just opening. You can hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Cool. Okay. So, Justin, um, just because we all need to agree on something here, uh, Editoria is by default something you can bend to be used just for what you need to do. If you need is to have one set of templates and always use them, that's it. You get those templates, you put them in the system, and you put your book out. But if you want to go and have a different way of working, so Punctum includes designers uh, into each of their book, and they can do that because Editoria is bended to do that. Right. So having the template collection is a way to be sure that uh, all the work that is open is shared. Right. And it's not locked to that. Um, and to jump on that, the question that Lisa put about are we able to change the layout in the UI? Actually, you could build something that will let you uh, move things around, like you would have your page numbers at the bottom or at the top or the left or the right. I could explain later uh, how it works, but it's too long and not really the place. Um, but we could build something like that. Uh, question is, would it be uh, branding? decision, uh, so you will have different books that look different, or maybe you want to have old book to look the same, and it's a publisher's uh, decision, right? So um, there is actually tools in Editoria that let you build book uh, by reducing cost as much as getting rid of all designers and typesetters, if that's what you want to do. And there is also something that lets you keep uh, designers and typesetters working, right? And you can do both, and you can reduce the price because the price is not. I mean, the money that you get is not only by how you typeset the book; it also on all the time you lost by sending you PDF and Word files and trying to work on something uh, that actually takes more time than paying the designers that gonna make the book. Um, that was just my simple take on that, and I will be happy to discuss longer with that um, later on. Yeah. I, I thank you, thank you, Julian. I just wanted to note that uh, I, th I think uh, we need to close the recording, but we can continue discussion our discussion uh, freely. Uh, I also want to remind once again uh, that uh, you're going to have the recording on the Open Publishing Fest website, and also you can contact for any one of the your needs uh, that the folks at Coca Foundation on the Mattermost, or if you can go to the to the uh, forum uh, and publish your questions there. I think people will uh, answer as fast as possible uh, all of your questions regarding any of the issues that we had. I don't know if you want to, to add something, uh, Vincent, before closing the recording. Oh, OK, we can hear you, but I think you said no. <laughs> uh... No, I said no. I have nothing. We are already over time. I just want to thank everybody for the uh, for for being present and for engaging. Abs absolutely. Thanks for the comments. And uh, yeah.